This presentation might be a bit more complicated. ACID is an advanced topic and it talks about best practices. Kotlin not to do list. The only presentation I know that talks about things that we should not do in Kotlin. It is based on the book uh, I just published as a beta. This is the book and uh, it's not yet published on paper but it is already available and it contains many items about things that we should do in Kotlin but some of them are about the things that are not really a good idea like not this way go somewhere somewhere else try something else and this is what I would like to tell you about in this presentation and I divided all those problems into three key categories into three biggest scenes of Kotlin developers. And the first one of them is that um, the Kotlin developers too often are trying, are trying to hide too much. And actually I think it goes even further. I think there is a growing culture of f hiding things in Kotlin. And this is not good. Just imagine that you are, you are in a hurry for an important meeting, but in your family there is a culture of hiding your ki key, car keys. And so, um, things that we most often uh, hide. Starting with something that we all love. Type inference. Yeah. It's great that we do not need to specify it's an int. It's clear that that's an int. It's great we do not need to specify it's a string. It's clear it's, clear it's a list of integers. But what the hell is that? I don't know. And it could be an important information. Um, and that's why my rule 14 is to specify variable type when it's not clear. It would be probably better for a reader to make it clear what type is that. It would be better for a reader, but it would be also better for a compiler, especially in two cases. So first of them is uh, connected with the fact that type inference is exact. So imagine that you have a class animal and subclass zebra. If you set some variable into zebra, you cannot set it to animal because your variable is, uh, the type of this variable is zebra. Does it make sense? Of course, it's easy to fix it. I can just set up type, but it's not always so easy. Imagine that we are making a public interface and this interface is used from outside. And uh, since you've noticed that most of your factories in your beautiful country are producing a similar model of a car. Can you see that? Is it, is it helpful? Yeah, similar model of a, of a car. You decided why not making it the default. This is what we have defaults for, aren't we? Uh, and then you think, well, car is specified in here, so I can infer it in here. Sometime later, someone decides that why not inferring type here as well? And ta-da! Now all you can produce is Fiat 126P. This is exactly what happened in Poland 40 years ago. <laughs> and so my item four is do not expose inferred type. Inferred types are especially Im uh, important and we often look for them and I am kind of sick of uh, trying to figure out what function returns, what type returns, and going up and up, and there are some generics on the way, and some flat maps, etc., etc. Um, type is an important information, especially in public interfaces. It's better to have it. Another important problem with typesetting is null safety. So as, as we know, we have a great null safety system that supports us on every step, but there is one small problem, what when, we are, uh, what when we are interoperating with Java? As you might know, when we have this Java annotated properly, we trust that those, ty those types are annotated, uh, are annotated okay, <laughs> and, uh, and we just use nullable or not nullable type. But one, what if this type is not annotated? So uh, we do not like this presentation and we, uh, uh, we, we avoid it as, as much as possible. And one of the biggest changes that was introduced in Android to support Kotlin was introducing all those, I mean, introducing Android nullable and not null annotations, but as well um, on, on other platforms, 
uh, they to support Kotlin introduce their own annotations and this way we make this interaction safer. But if we manage to have this type without any annotation uh, inferred in Kotlin, then we have a very special type. That is called, how is it called? It's called platform type. And we note it as a type name with exclamation mark on the end. You cannot use it in Kotlin, but it is used on documentation and, war and on warnings. So what is, what is this, uh, this platform type? Platform type, as you can see, can be either treated as nullable or treated as not nullable. It's like we haven't yet decided, so you can still decide. What is to some, uh, on some way, comfortable, but on the other way, uh, unsafe. So if this get user returns now, then only user two will, will throw null pointer exception. But believe me, the worst implementation is user one because we are propagating platform time. So imagine that you are getting null as a platform type from Java. And in both cases, you are using it as not nullable. So in both cases, you will have null pointer exception. But there is a significant difference. So in the first case, uh, so, so if you state this type immediately, you will have this null pointer exception where it comes from Java and with explicit error saying basically what you should improve. If you just use it somewhere in the middle, you don't know where this null pointer exception will, will just blow. This, this variable can be used few times safely and then unsafely. It's like a ticking bomb just waiting for someone uh, to use it incorrectly and bam. It is also, uh, that's why I have a rule eliminate platform types as soon as possible. But also, platform types very, rare, well, very badly interoperate with, with our typing system. So imagine what might happen if we manage to uh, infer platform type into, into some public interface or a public, uh, or a public uh, method. So in here, I made an interface and I inferred platform type. So I can still decide if this is nullable or not nullable. Yeah? So when I am making my definition, I can decide it's nullable. But when I use it, I can decide it's not nullable. And this way I have null pointer exception produced in Kotlin and blown in Kotlin. Yeah. Basically when we are propagating platform type, we made things behave like in Java. So unknown null nullability and no safety. Of course, there is this warning uh, that says you that you should not infer platform type um, on a public interfaces, but I, it does not stop some people. Another thing that people often, hmm? do you have any questions? I, another thing that people often hide is a receiver, which is also a great feature. So in here, instead of using this source entry again and again and again and again, we can just use apply and reference it once and then set it and then reference it implicitly um, inside the body of this apply. But when we are, um, that, but it, we need to be careful with, with hiding receiver because when there are too many receivers that can be used, uh, things can easily go wrong. And that's why first small suggestion is that I I suggest to use it explicitly, at least consider that. Uh, we definitely use it in every extension function. So in here, it's not clear where does first and drop come from. But when we just use explicit receiver, we do not add a lot to this function, but I think we add a lot to uh, re readability of this function. So we make it explicit where does those methods come from. But it is especially important when we are having many receivers. So in here, it's a, it's a strange situation when we, where we are creating child in make child function. 
and then we want to print its name. So we apply created name. And we expect that if create returns no, uh, child, then we will we'll print child name. Aren't we? Well, as, as you can see now, there is a created parent. And why is that? Yes, but what happens when there are multiple receivers? Well, but by default, if we do not specify... Well, so, so every new receiver, so this is one receiver, the parent is one receiver, and he, here you open another receiver. And every new receiver is hiding the, the one before. And when we are calling some method implicitly, we are first trying on the closest receiver. If there is no such method, we are trying on, on the deeper one, and deeper one, and deeper one, and deeper one. So what happened in here is that we wanted to call name, and we wanted to call it from node. But we cannot call it. To understand why we cannot call it, we can use uh, receiver explicitly. So we use this. And when you use receiver explicitly, you will see that error receiver is nullable. So we couldn't use, use name from the child. So implicitly, we used name from outer receiver that is parent. No warning, no, no notice, nothing. So this is, not, this is not uncommon when we are, this is a very simple example, but this is not uncommon when we have a lot of DSLs and adding more and more receivers. It's, it's very, it's easy to uh, mistake from which receiver we are using. And when you use explicit receiver, you are, you are always using very concrete one. Even if you just use this, this means only the closest receiver, not the outer ones. So, Explicit use is always safer. This one can be solved by safe call, but of course, this is still not a correct use of apply because, because of this problem, we are not using apply this way. Whenever we are adding some additional operation, we are using also or let, which, are, which force us to use explicit uh, argument because we use it using it instead of using this. Does it make sense? Perfect. Another uh, suggestion that I have is to avoid member extensions. Apparently some people uh, are doing that and I think people are doing that to limit visibility of such extension functions. Um, it does not work because you can still use it only in a weird way. Uh, if you do not need it to be um, a member and lift it into top level. And if you do not, uh, and if you want to limit its visibility, we limit visibility using visibility modifiers. Member extensions cannot be referenced. Uh, extension functions can be referenced like any function except of member extensions. Um, also, there are many question marks when you use member extensions. So imagine that you use something from, uh, that, that you use a property or a, a function that is both in a, in a dispatch receiver and an extension receiver, so both in A and B. So what does A, where does it, uh, uh, what is the value of A in here? Where does it come from? Okay. Yeah, it's actually from A, but some people might guess it's from B. Also, when you're supposed to update receiver, which receiver do you suppose to, up to update? There is no clear answer to that because, you know, one rabbin will say A, another rabbin will say B. So it's not clear. And this is about hiding, hiding things and that we do not need to hide. Another big problem in, in Kotlin community that I see is that people, two of them are trying to choose short over a uh, readable. And there is this, there are those, um, yeah, sorry. So the, the goal of Kotlin is not to be concise. Many people, say they love Kotlin because it's concise, but it's not a goal at all. If you like concise languages, then I have a great news for you, because they are more concise languages. For instance, this is Game on of Life. Do you know this, this algorithm? It took me like 10, 15 uh, lines at least to implement it in Kotlin uh, in, a, in, a, in a correct way. In APL, you can do it in one. <laughs> so your, your first thought is probably, whoa, that's, that's short. Another one is, 
I do not have half of those characters on my keyboard. <laughs> yeah, so um, it's also highly unre uh, not readable. Um, I think even those few APL developers that exist worldwide might have a problem to understand it if we would use some other name instead of life. But it's a perfect for uh, uh, programming golf contests, so very useful languages. Another language like that is J. Kotlin is not designed to be concise, Kotlin is designed to be readable. And we should have readability in our mind primarily. And this fact can be, this difference can be well reflected on those two code snippets. So I asked many developers, including asking on, on, on Twitter, which one do they prefer? And I, I was um, surprised how many developers, ex especially experienced developers, said that they prefer the second one. I think it's a perfect, um, it's a perfect code snippet if you would like to show to the, all those newbies how great you are in Kotlin and what amazing features do you, do you uh, know. Also, it might be really useful if, uh, if the new person you just hired is, you know, thinking he's or she's too important in the company and you want to show him or her. So compare those two. For a, from an eye of a new person, the first one is clear as it is nearly the same as in nearly all other languages. The second one is hugely terrifying. It contains many features like safe call, uh, take if, let, a function bounded function reference, Elvis operator with some expression on the right side. So second one is very hard. First one can be understood even by JavaScript developers. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but also, uh, for, the, for an experienced person, I, I see the first one and I, I know what's, what's going on here. To understand the second one, I still need to read it carefully, so it takes more time, more concentration as well. Also, think what, what would happen if you would need to apply some changes. Let's say that you need to add something to those branches. So in the first one, that's, that's easy. I just add something to those branches. In the second one, oh, I cannot use function reference, so I need to refactor it, and then I cannot just use uh, Elvis operator this way, so I need to wrap it somehow. So for instance, run function, and it's getting even more terrible. Yeah. And finally, also, yeah, also debugging and, and, and support is, is better for the first one. And also the second one adds a little bit of, of trash, so it's slightly slower. But there is one big difference, there is one big uh, thing that we need to say. Who noticed that those two do not behave the same way? So any idea what might be the difference? The first one. The first one is the person who couldn't know. No. So okay, so when the first one shows error, when person is now or is not an adult, okay. When the second one shows an error, when person is now, when it's not an adult, or when view show person returns now. It is, it is possible, isn't it? Someone might define this function, let's say show person uh, to return, I don't know, in old languages there was this practice to return some error message or an error code or null. Someone might do that. So um, the point is that showing an unusual behavior, uh, seeing unusual behavior in complicated code snippets, it's much, much harder. It's much better to stick with what we already know, what we are used to. We, are all, we all have much more experience in programming in general than in programming in Kotlin, and it's better to use those, use that. So, um, a few rules about uh, readability. 
uh, and one of them is was already slightly touched, but there is a person be, be, be behind that avoiding operate in, uh, operating on unit nullable that my close friend on a recrutation process was asked by a recruiter, uh, why would we need to return unit nullable? And it turned out that the good answer was that, well, it's like a Boolean, but it, we can use all the cool features that therefore nullability support. So for instance, we might use Elvis operator with, with return on the right side, or, uh, or some, yeah, or some other support for nulls. Well, it's, maybe it's possible, but it is not how we should use uh, unit and nulls. Uh, for saying if something is true or not, we have already a perfect type that is called Boolean, and it's, it's actually easier. We also have a great support for Boolean, and it's better to use it this way. Okay. So uh, another uh, problem, actually, actually a father of all problems, uh, starts also with a story on one of my workshops as a, as a, a mini task uh, on the workshop was implementing a factorial func function. We already had a product function, so factorial was actually pretty simple. You might be familiar that factorial is a mathematical uh, concept, a number, a, 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 a product of all numbers from one to, to that number. And in mathematics, it is noted as an exclamation mark after a number. And it was actually um, clear for, for one of my uh, attendees as uh, during operation overloading section, he, no uh, he noticed that, well, we can actually have a similar behavior if we only put exclamation mark before six, if we just make an extension function not for an integer. So this is a reuse of an operator not, and this is, a, this is just a terrible idea. Notice that now you can just make not on a number and, uh, and uh, produce some big number that is, looks very much like JavaScript. And, <laughs> and as the name of this function suggests, this is not how we should use this operator. And the general rule is that we should be consistent with function name. Every operator is primarily a function, an operator secondarily. And you should primarily be consistent with function name. Every operator in Kotlin has its own name. Uh, it's bounded to that name. And it can be used from behind that name instead of from behind an operator. So if you, if you look on, on Twitter for crazy things with Kotlin, most of them uh, include some weird operator overloading. There are some cases that are not clear, that are discussive. Like someone might say that, well, three times function is definitely a function that repeats the previous one three times. Does it make sense? But well, then the other person will come and say, no, 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 no. Three times function is calling function three times. So, well, they will never agree because there are no one guide, there's no one guideline. And so <coughs> not no of this use is uh, correct. It's much better to use infix function, which are descriptive, which, is, which have names and are less confusing. So we can make three times repeated to, um, to repeat function and times, as well as uh, you can use top-level function uh, like repeat that is already present in the standard library. So the general idea, if you have unclear cases, is better not to use operators because someone, someone will be confused by them. It's better to use functions. They are better, dis more descriptive. OK, and finally, the, the third biggest sin of, of Kotlin developers, disrespecting contracts. Uh, notion of contract, I, I've noticed it's nearly forgotten nowadays. Uh, that's why I spend a lot of pages on, on that, on setting up contracts. Contract is a set of promise that a developer gives, a creator gives to a user. And there is this communication that 
that makes our nowadays programming. But it's better to show it on an example and we can start with a very clear uh, item for most Java developers, minimize items visibility. So when you have some class, you are probably familiar with a concept that it's better to make private what does not need to be public or in other way limit its uh, visibility. Why do we want to do that? There are very good reasons behind that. So first of all, we want our interfaces as small as possible. Every function needs to be maintained, needs to be tested, needs to be, uh, needs to be respected, documented. So it's, it's, it's just easier to have less functions. Uh, people might, if it's public, people will use that and then you have some responsibilities because changing that might make many people angry or if it's, it's your project might, might make your evening not so good. Um, because you need to go through the code and adjust all the uses into some uh, alternative. It is also, uh, yeah, uh, it is also easier to expose something in the future than hide something like the same problem, uh, getting, getting, uh, taking functionalities from people that they use is not a good idea. Uh, also, about the state of a function, what primarily relates to properties, um, class cannot be responsible for its own state when it, is, uh, when, it cannot, when it can be changed from outside. So here, previous user, you can guess, it should be documented, but you can guess it means the previously downloaded user. But it, if it would be public, it, would mean, uh, it could mean anything because any class could change it from outside. So you, you, you are never sure how, how it is used. Also, it is easier to, to track and understand how class works when it has smaller visibility, more restricted visibility, less things to use, more, easier to understand. But it needs to be understood that limiting visibility is primarily defining a contract, a communication with a user. It's not really a, a tool to stop someone, to, to, to really stop someone from doing uh, something. Formally, we can uh, formally, we can do everything in a Java virtual machine if we uh, really want. So think about this simple uh, class with a private function. It is private, so you think, hey, it cannot be used from outside. But actually, to use it from outside, all we need to do is to sit down and reflect and get function ref class reference, get member functions, find function by name, open it, and then we can just call it. As simple as that. We can open uh, everything and call it using reflection. If you think that people won't do that because it's just too complicated, I can make an extension function. <laughs> people won't do that because it's a, it's a part of the contract that the creator wants this function to be, uh, wants, uh, don't want you to use this function. So from one side, it's a part of a culture, but from other side, it's a part of responsibility. So when creator makes something private, he is, uh, he knows he can change whatever he thinks. Uh, I mean, he can change a name of this function. He can change everything in this private function because you should not use it from outside. And if you use it, then it's your responsibility, it's like warranty. You opened your computer, now I don't accept it in, in the service. And so this is a part of the contract, but it's not the only part of a contract. Contract is in big part defined with documentation. And it's also a material for a great book, but, a, uh, but uh, this documentation is, is defined in, uh, uh, in, in KDOC that are, that are comments before functions and with all the disrespect that our community right now has to comments, this is a very important use of comments, defining a contract, defining how functions should be used, because it's, it makes this communication between those two. We also should, uh, we also should uh, respect this contract and think about nearly any function from standard library. What you might notice is that they all have a really well-defined contract. And by well-defined contract, I mean that this contract is minimalistic. So it gives 
creators a lot of freedom. It very often also returns interfaces, except of classes, what gives even more freedom because they can return anything they want as long as it is of uh, uh, it's a subtype of list. And so from, from creator's perspective, this is the, the best the best contract because it it describes all that is needed and at the same time nothing more so you knowing that that uh, platform specific collections are returned might try to hug this function and for instance upcast it into multiple list and add some element what what will happen then Well, I don't know. Contract says nothing about it, so it can, it can do anything. Maybe some country will just blow. I don't know. Uh, <coughs> actually, on JavaScript, on, on Kotlin JS, it, it will work fine. On Kotlin JVM, it will throw an exception. Anything can happen. Uh, probably soon it won't work anyway, because they are introducing Im immutable lists. So, I don't know, using that is like a ticking bomb. So sooner or later, something will work, it will stop working in your project. The correct way that is, uh, that is uh, correct according to the contract is to use a proper function on an interface list. So this is a function on an interface list to multiple list. So this is fully correct with the contract. And so this is the correct way that respects abstraction contract. Uh, when we talk about abstraction contracts, we uh, need to tell a word about few functions with, the, with a really well-defined contract that is equals and hash code. Uh, we won't talk about all that because it took a lot of pages and we have limited time. Uh, but you, you need to know that there is a set contract for equals, so whenever you uh, extend it, whenever you uh, overwrite it, you need to be uh, uh, you, you need to respect this contract. And what might happen if you uh, do not respect it? So here is an, uh, 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 an example. And how, how much time do we have? Five, ten minutes. Five, ten minutes. So take a look at that and tell me what's wrong in here. Who read Effective Java? Okay, <laughs> few, few people. So, okay, any ideas? You shouldn't compare doubles. Why? I can, I will go back in here. We, sh our equals should be reflexive, symmetric, transitive, consistent, and not equal to null. So what's, what's wrong in here? Okay, so I will tell you. So in here, we have complex number with a real part and imaginary part. And we can compare it to double. So if real imaginary part is equal to zero and real part is, is like the same as, as double, then we assume they are, they are equal to each other. But we, yeah, but what about the other side? What if we are trying to compare double to co uh, complex? So this implementation is not symmetric. It's only one, 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 one example. You can, you, you, I, I have an example of breaking all the traits of, of equals. This implementation is not symmetric. What does it mean? What might go wrong with, 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 this, with this part of contract being broken? Well, imagine that you are checking if some uh, some element is in a, in a list, or you are using assert, assert equals, or whatever else. Let, we, we, we could use assert equals one and, and complex one and zero. So what, what result do you expect in here? Well, I don't know. What, one, in one collection it will be true, in another it will be false, but because one collection will, will compare the first one to the other, and another to the other to the first one. 
it might change during uh, when, when, I don't know, when at some time this collection will be optimized. The same with assert equals. One assert equals might check this to that and another that to this. I, I don't know. You, you cannot trust anything that uses equals under the hood. So you cannot basically trust contains equals, assert equals, anything that uses equals under the hood. Does it make sense? And, and even if you, if you checked and your implementation works fine, then someone will at some point make some optimization inside and apply some changes and accidentally he will reverse the order and all your beautiful code will stop working. Well, that's, that's what happens when you break contracts. Same with hash code. Hash code has two parts, two important parts of contract. Uh, first one um, is broken in here. It, it's, it's, it's rather known. What, what do you think is, is wrong in here? So like hash code is, is an algorithm that, that puts uh, our uh, elements into buckets. So when we have a set, we, there are some buckets and based on hash code, we decide into which bucket do we want to put it. But hash code needs to be consistent with equals. So here we have equals, but we do not have hash code. So hash code will place into a bucket according to its hash, uh, uh, a class hash, but equals will expect that elements that are equal to each other are uh, in the same, uh, 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 yeah, are, are in the same bucket, and it will be wrong. So again, two elements are equal to each other, but you have set with one of them. You add another one, and uh, sorry, and uh, you you have a set with one of them. You check for the other one, and it's not present there uh, because they are in different buckets. So the same, you cannot. You cannot trust set, map, etc., etc. Many developers had a great solution to that. If hash code decides into which bucket do we place an element, and the only requirement is that equal elements needs to be in the same that bucket, why not? Ah, yeah, there is a warning if you forget about hash code and you have equals. So why not just returning some constant? Genius. Well, everything will be in the same bucket, so you will never miss the same elements. Yeah, does it make sense? So what might go wrong? Uh, it will actually work correctly, but not really efficiently. And to show uh, how much, I made a test and I created a set of uh, correct names and you might notice that during this set creation, we need to compare, but they all ended in a different bucket. So equals is used zero times. But on the other hand, when you make a set the same size with incorrect implementation, equals is used five millions, 11, oh sorry, 50 millions, 116,683 times. Hmm, that's because we, forgot to implement hash code. Also, when you are trying to find some element in the correct set, in a set with a correct element, with a correctly implemented hash code, you can see equals is used one time when it's present and zero times when it's not present there. When you do the same for incorrect one, it's many times. So when it's, not, it, when it's present, it's some number from one to 10,000. When it's not present, as you can see, over 10,000. So this is what happens if you return a uh, constant. Uh, also, there, the also, Kotlin features have their own contract. That is, there is some responsibility, some, some associations with how Kotlin features should be used. And we talk about it a, a lot in the workshop. So uh, what seems to be wrong in this example? Pretty deep recursion. Yeah, but we'll still. It's still. A, it's still. A, um, I, I think it's a correct algorithm. It might be optimized, but but I, I think that that there is something other that is really terribly wrong when you look at that. Why why is that a, why is that a property? Why it's not a function? So 
some implements some algorithm, algorithm of, 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 of counting sum of all numbers, and it's supposed to be a function. The, the, the contract is that we expect that the algorithms, that the behavior is behind functions. Properties represent state. They should not represent business logic. They should not represent, they should not have a computational complexity. Properties should be simple, represent state or modified state. Uh, and the same in the other side. This is also, this also seems terrible in, in Kotlin because uh, get name and set name is, is definitely an area of, of, of properties. Instead of that, we should define custom getter and custom setter because we use functions to represent state, not, uh, sorry, properties to represent state, not functions. And the last short uh, part is to use function types instead of interfaces. This is a habit of some people from Java, so some people to set up some listeners, observer, ob observers or whatever else, they use interfaces uh, like, in, like we did in Java. To, to, to provide an object of such interface, you need to create an object using a class or object expression. Uh, but the Kotlin way is to use uh, function types instead. It gives us more flexibility, but it's also much better supported in Kotlin. So such properties can be filled with lambda expressions, anonymous function, uh, function reference, bounded function reference, and even with object implementing functional types. Yep, it's possible functional types. Function types are interfaces under the hood. And that's all that I uh, had for you today. And uh, those are three biggest scenes of Kotlin developers, hiding too much, choosing short over readable, and disrespecting uh, contracts. Uh, those are items, if you want to look for them later, that I used from the book. Book is available, some parts are, are, uh, are available for free in the internet. And I hope that you, uh, and, uh, and slides are already on my uh, Twitter, but I will also republish them again tomorrow morning. So I hope that you enjoyed this presentation and that you learned something. Fair, thank you for today. And one thing that I forgot, uh, this, this uh, workshop is not for a person, so if you, have, if you know something that might be interesting, you just, can just fill your data, and if you win, you can just give it to the, this person, and this person can figure out tomorrow if he or she can go. Does it make sense? Okay. Uh, do you have any questions? I know that we, uh, I, it, it was a bit longer than I, I, I expected, so if you, if, you want to, uh, if you want to leave, just leave. And, uh, for all others, do you have any questions? Everything is clear? Everything is clear? Very good. Very good. Okay, Very perfect. Good. <laughs> okay, so see you uh, on the next meeting or on the workshop in Monday. Thank you.